Well, this is Current Yield, Grant's Interest Rate Observer of the Air, and uh, I am Jim Grant. As always, I, yeah, that's true, right? Yeah, most of the time. And with me, as always, is uh, Evan Lorenz, the great deputy editor of Grant's. Henry French is at the control panel, and now, uh, well, oh yes, we have a guest today, and not just any guest, we have Jim Bianco himself. James Bianco, um, uh, the eponym of Bianco Research in Chicago, somebody who knows more about the bond market than what? Alexander Hamilton, who, 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 who basically invented the American wing of the bond market. Uh, I happen to have gone through uh, college with Hamilton at uh, Columbia, and uh, he, he thinks about uh, Jim Bianco as we do which is uh, a sage. Jim is the fellow who knows more about the numbers than most economists and more about the way the market works than most investors. And the two of them together, he is one formidable figure. So Jim Bianco, welcome. Wow, that's a very nice uh, intro. So thank you very much. Yeah, well, it is from the heart and from the head um, equally. Here we are on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. And I think it would be churlish to begin on a bearish note, but Bonds aren't your thing, is that so, Jim? Yeah, uh, um, I've been uh, going around uh, giving a lot of presentations. I was in Europe uh, last week, and most of the people there were bullish on bonds. So I started by saying something that I'm sure was never heard in the halls of grants. Hi, my name is Jim, and I'm bearish, <laughs> is the way that I would start all of my meetings. Basically, the 40-year bull market in bonds ended in 2020. And we're in a multi-year bear market in bonds. Um, yeah, you can have a couple of year rally in there along the way. I don't think we're quite ready to do that yet. But I do think that rates are going to um, continue higher. Or to put it in your terms, Jim, uh, there are interest rates to observe. And there's going to be more interest rates to observe as we uh, move forward from here. Well, I think both of us, we were, we were at the receiving end of a existential threat an existential threat to the business model of interest rate observation. And it uh, came a little personal around here, too, I must say. I... We also found out that uh, during that period when uh, you had your existential threat, that zero wasn't even a floor for interest <laughs> rates. And, uh, you know, Sidney Homer's book, you know, didn't even contemplate that when he looked back to interest rates to Mesopotamia. Yeah. Well, Irving Fisher did, one of the great interest rate theorists of, of America. And uh, he had a couple of paragraphs on... Uh, the theoretical basis of zero percent, or so, sorry, sub-zero rates. But but uh, Irving Fisher never said that you would accumulate more than sixteen trillion dollars worth of them, as actually happened, I think, in the year two thousand and twenty-one or something. Yeah, it was uh, twenty nineteen, and is actually, I was looking at those numbers recently. Uh, they just ticked off zero um, just in the last uh, couple of weeks. Like, yeah, a couple of very short-term bills in Japan went back negative. That's all we have left now on the planet in terms of zero <laughs> interest rates. Or negative interest rates, excuse me. Has there, has there ever been a greater um, evidence of, of excess? I mean, there, there are certainly, there are, there are, there are kind of uh, flash mob incidences of, of excess in all speculative markets, right? From tulip bulbs on. Like, oh, I guess there's some scholars who say the tulip bulbs thing was a, actually well considered. But let's use tulip bulbs as a, a literary or a, a, a metaphorical thing. So, so the, these kind of flash episodes occur uh, persistently, you know, uh, episodically. But I'm not sure that anything has been so excessive at such a considered length of years as was the, uh, the phenomenon of negative nominal yields. And whether that's true or not, I don't know. but what do you suppose, Jim, it signifies so far as, as, as punctuating a cycle? Is this the thing that people look back on and say it didn't happen because it couldn't have? Oh, no, I, I, I think that uh, you're right that this punctuated a cycle like we've never seen before. And to this day, people are still having a difficult time understanding that, you know, let's call it the 2009 to 2020 period or in terms of the U.S. market, the QE period. Yes. And they're trying to figure it out because when I said, my name is Jim and I'm bearish, one of the retorts you'll hear from people a lot is, boy, rates have gone up a lot. And they're really, they're at 15-year highs on real rates. We're at 16 or 23-year, excuse me, 23-year highs on mortgage rates. They've gone too far. And I was like, well, you've got an anchoring problem. You're coming off yes, of right. that extraordinary uh, disconnect of that 2009 to 2020 period. Those were the rates that were incorrect. The rates that we have now 
if you go back and you look at history and you go, what were the average interest rates before 2009? They're pretty close to what we have right now. Yeah, 5 so or 6% is, is kind of the average American interest rate going back to the founding of the country. Right. And so this isn't even a new normal. This is just returning to what they used to be before, yes, right. the, um, uh, before the QE period. And no less than the average economist in the United States is struggling with this, because what is the consistent call been for the last five or six weeks, or five or six quarters, excuse me, is we're going to have a recession. Now, I happen to subscribe to the Bernanke theory about recessions that, you know, expansions don't die of old age, they're murdered. So something has to murder the expansion. And eventually something does, they always do. But the perception is that that murder weapon has been higher interest rates. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't come to pass because, as you pointed out, 5 6% has been the average. That's pretty much where we're approaching with rates. They haven't gone high enough to break anything yet. And since they haven't, that's why we continue to see the economy perform better than we think. And that's going to lead, I think, to ultimately even higher rates. And eventually we'll get to that point where either the murder weapon is interest rates or it's oil. Those are usually the two uh, most um, commonly seen murder weapons or financial crisis like we saw, saw in 2008. But one of those will eventually come mm -hmm. down the pike and murder this. But right now, the idea that the consensus on Wall Street is that the current level of interest rates is that murder weapon, I don't think is quite there yet. Yeah. If the economy is murdered by higher rates, what signs do you see? And uh, in recent weeks, we've actually heard a number of kind of negative anecdotes, like subprime auto delinquencies are the highest ever, at least going back to like the early 90s. We've had Walmart, Wendy's, Target, um, Home Depot come out and talk about a weakening consumer. It seems like some things are slowing, despite the fact that we're getting really still good economic numbers overall. If the economy is going to die from higher rates, what does it look like and what are you looking for? Yeah. So, you know, let's keep in mind that the third quarter GDP, and I just look at GDP as just being an aggregation of all the statistics, was very strong. So we're seeing some slowdown from that. And yeah, anywhere in a $30 trillion economy, you're going to find problems, whether it's in delinquencies here or housing there. Um, you know, the consumer here or manufacturing there, there's always going to be some issues. But to your question, what is it that will tell you that we're really on the pre pre precipice of breaking something? To use the Wall Street parlance, risk markets. Um, when we break something, the last thing you want to do is own stocks. You don't want to own stocks in the process of breaking something on the idea of, oh, good, everything's going to hell. So lower interest rates means that I should be long stocks. It's, oh, good, everything's going to hell, means I got to get out of the riskiest of assets, which would be something like equities. So since the equity market seems to be having no problem with this, since the corporate credit markets don't seem to have a problem with this, I, I kind of conclude that we're not there yet in terms of having that murder weapon, um, you know, e exercising itself right now. You know, Jim, the, the, the government would seem to have a, a vested interest in uh, lower rates. It is, of course, a, a massive net debtor. It is a collector of capital gains taxes, and it is a bank regulator. And as to the third, um, uh, the third item, bank regulation, a scholar at the uh, American Enterprise Institute, Paul Kupiak, uh, is just out with an analysis. Uh, he looked at uh, bank call reports as of June 30th and found that uh, something like 2,300 or 2,400 banks uh, holding about uh, slightly more than half of the assets, the total assets in the banking system, um, were marked to market uh, on a leverage ratio basis, and they showed uh, less than 4%, which is a threshold for uh, you know, uh, corrective action, uh, the uh, the brand of being significantly undercapitalized. So the, the banking system is still kind of, not, not teetering exactly, but it is it is uh, bearing the burden of um, a very, very quick uh, return to something like normal interest rates. So the question to you is, might the something that hypothetically, prospectively will break, might that thing be the thing that would seem almost to have been discounted, namely, difficulties in the banking system having to do with unrealized but still real uh, losses on fixed income securities. Oh, yeah, th th there's definitely that. I mean, the banking system, just to, you know, uh, you know, support what you were saying, the bank stocks have been not only among the worst performers this year, 
um, as I like to joke with the banking industry, that you could sum up the the banking industry as J.P. Morgan and various levels of suck <laughs> is basically what they be uh, is what you see. And as you get to mid cap banks, small cap banks, they do much worse and worse. It is a going to be a real problem. But now is it the worst that we've seen this year? If you go back to the finan- the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, <clears throat> of the 11 sectors in the S&P, the worst performing of those is the financial sector. And the worst industry within the financial sector has been the banks. It's been about the worst place to be in the last 15 years. And that's been a big sore point for value investors because a lot of value investors kind of instinctively hit knee, leg goes up, keep gravitating towards financial stocks all the time because they see compelling values. And of course, there's a reason that these stocks continue to have compelling values. And now the newest problem they're having, their old problems used to be uh, with regulation, but now their newest problem, you're right, is with higher interest rates. And so they are teetering on this problem. So I'd say to you, that's a great place to look for the murder weapon would be if the banking industry or the banking system seems to have a problem. And I might also add within that, there's a new twist within the problems that the banking system are having, and it's been relabeled as the bank walk. And that is not a run, but that is people are starting to realize that their banking accounts, especially if you have one at Chase, the, you know your deposit accounts are yielding you somewhere near zero, and the money market accounts are yielding you somewhere north of 5%, and why don't I move my money? Well, prior to 2008, moving your money was an arduous task. You physically had to go to the branch and fill out paperwork, uh, and as I like to joke, wait a week and find out it was filled out incorrectly, and go back and fill it out, wait another week, then the approval comes through, Then you transfer your money, wait three days, then you can put it in a money market fund, and no one did that. Today, you pick up your phone, and you could transfer your money in five seconds. And that's what the bank walk is, is this relentless deposit outflow that we're seeing from the banking system. So really what's happening with banks is they are pulling back on lending, and they are pulling back on a lot of their activities. And really where that's hurting is in the bottom half of the economy. What I mean by bottom half, the companies that don't have the scale that they could go to the to the credit markets to borrow. So mid large cap companies that could just file a 144 and issue a bond, either be high yield or investment grade, they can get still very attractive terms. But if you're a smaller company and you need to rely on borrowing from a bank, those terms are not very attractive because of the problems that the banking system is having. Uh, and I think that's going to continue to be. And then you throw in on top of that, this whole remote work uh, phenomenon is really got office real estate in a bad place right now. And 75% of all commercial lending in the United States has been done by a regional or small bank. It has not been done by a money center bank. And so they're sitting with Mortgages on half empty buildings, as you said, you know, no one's in Manhattan today. No one's in any office today in the United States. And the problem with Monday is they're only going to be about half full on Monday, which is why you're seeing a lot of office real estate struggling. So no doubt the banking industry is one of the weak spots of this economy right now. And it's one of the things that I've been focused on as far as a potential murder weapon for the economy. But I don't think it's quite there yet, or at least it hasn't quite murdered it. You said in terms of looking for um, when the murder actually happens, you're following the stock market. I think the S&P is up 18% year to date, but you've pointed out um, that most of those gains are from seven stocks. And you've done an analysis on the top concentration of seven stocks in the S&P 500 going back to, I think, the 50s. And there's never been a time when seven stocks have accounted for more of the market than they do today. So what, what does the market tell you when breadth is so narrow and so much is concentrated in so few? So a couple of things. You're right. Um, so the, the magnificent seven stocks are 30 percent of the S&P. Uh, I got the da- data going back, you know, decades and decades. And I think that I believe that to be the highest percentage that we've ever seen from seven stocks. Um, well, forever it's worth, AT&T did hit 11 percent of the market cap of the S&P in the 1960s and Apple's at seven and a half. So that's about the only record we have not taken out yet um, at this point. The 18% gain in the S&P, about 14 or 15% of that is those seven stocks. 
And the other 493 stocks are accounting for somewhere between 2 and 3% of the gain in the S&P. And I'm talking on a year-to-date basis here. Um, they're underperforming cash, those other 493 stocks, collectively, as far as their influence on um, the S&P. So I, take, I have two takeaways from that. The first one is interest rates matter. We used to talk about TINA back before 2020. There is no alternative. Today, there is an alternative, and it is a 5.5% money market fund. Dr. Jeremy Siegel updated his uh, book, Stocks for the Long Run, a new edition is out this year. And in it, he says that the long-term return for the stock market through all cycles up and down is about 8%. Well, if I'm going to get 5 to 5.5% without any market risk in a money market fund, I'm getting about two-thirds of that gain. So what is it worth to take that risk to get the other one-third and a lot of people are concluding it's not. So there is an alternative. Uh, so you could tell me about the stock market and you go, great. It's returned zero over the last two years, bad in 22, good in 23. Uh, but I'm getting most of that away from the stock market with very a little uh, market risk. So there's there's that. And the second thing I think that's happening is because of higher rates, and because of the Magnificent Seven, they have a theme around them or a narrative around them about artificial intelligence. Now, we could argue whether that's a valid theme or not, but I also think that we are finally transitioning away from the era of index buying. Just Everybody just buy the S&P 500 ETF. That's all you need to do. All the boats go up and that there's your investing strategy. And if you want to get nuanced, we could go into a 60-40 portfolio and we put 40% of your funds in the bond market ETF to good old-fashioned Peter Lynch stock picking. I think that that era is starting to return. Now, there's two problems or there's two issues with that. One, a lot of people are going to nod and go, yes, stock picking is coming back. And I would argue 90% of them that are nodding have never had to do it. And we don't know whether they can do that. And so it's a whole new set of muscle skills that have not been exercised on Wall Street for a long time. And we'll have to see whether or not we can do that without you know the in, the cramps and the aches and the pains along the way of trying to figure out how to get back to a stock picking era or peter lynch can come out of retirement because it seems like we've got the peter lynch era starting to return and uh, and so i do think that one of the reasons that we are going back to a stock picking environment is because we are in what i've referred to as a post covid economy I think a lot of trends have changed about this economy. The economy has evolved in ways that we don't understand, whether it's remote work, it's deglobalization, it's energy as a political weapon, and a lot of things need to be restructured, need to change because of that. Change does not mean dystopian. And that means that there's going to be specific winners and losers in this post-COVID economy, not general winners and losers. So it's not just oh, I'm bullish on energy, just buy, buy the energy ETF. It's which energy stocks? And that's something we haven't had to talk about for a long time. Which reminds me that um, I want to say a nice word about our sponsor. Well, since 2007, SRS Aquium has been obsessed with a single purpose, to simplify the administration for M&A deals so that deal parties and their advisors can focus on bigger issues. SRS Aquium was a pioneer in professional shareholder representation digital M&A payments, and online stockholder solicitation. And they continue to raise bars and set industry standards. Case in point, well, their new VDR, which is changing the way deal parties think about virtual data rooms. The more tracking down thumb drives are asking how the VDR bill got so high, SRS Aquium keeps deal documents securely stored on the cloud for as long as you want for one flat rate. And working with SRS Equium means you get the simplicity and stability of a single best-in-class partner for that pitch book through that last dollar out. 50% of U.S. private equity firms and 40% of venture capital firms worldwide count on SRS Equium to optimize how their deals get done. To learn more about SRS Equium and how is it simply the smartest way to run a deal, head to srsaquium.com. That's srs 
A-C-Q-U-I-O-M, S-R-S, Acquium.com. Yeah, so, um, Jim, the, the latest things, uh, the hottest things in sliced bread now is private credit, which is uh, non-traded loans usually funding highly levered transactions, usually private equity buyouts. Um, private credit has taken off, and the proponents of private credit actually believe that private credit is going to actually take over the overregulated banking imp- uh, uh, banking lending. They point to the fact that in um, the summer, Aries bought a $3.5 billion portfolio of consumer and business loans from PacWest. Um, and these weren't high yielding loans. They were just standard auto loans or real estate related loans. And that private credit's going to basically fill in the role for, um, for bank lending going forward. How does this kind of complicate the picture of looking at banks as kind of the barometer of the economy and kind of the health of the financial system? Well, it definitely does because, uh, you know, one of the stats I gave you before is that, you know, what is the worst sector and the worst industry within that sector since 2008? It's been the banking system. And I, I think the takeaway from that has been that the market is signaling that there needs to be a disruption and a change in the financial system. And it's coming at it in a lot of different ways, whether it's crypto, it's fintech, or it's private credit, that the banking system has become such a public utility and now an overregulated public utility with its you know, cost of goods being interest rates going up, that it's finding itself in a very play, poor place to position uh, to compete. So fintech is probably going to you know be the place that we're going to go for innovative finance. It's no longer going to be the banks. Crypto might be the place that we're going to go for payments. That's still years away right now, but we seem to be, or at least digital assets might be the place where we were going to go for payments and. That's still years away. And where do we go for lending? And it might wind up becoming um, private credit. Now, the problem I see that private credit is going to have is there's one place that's got a big vested interest. It's the Eccles Building in Washington or 33 Liberty Street in Lower Manhattan. They have long viewed the primary purpose of the banking industry to be lending. Um, whenever you ask about any innovation in, in the banking industry, they seem to look at it from the point of view is what does this mean for banks as a credit intermediary? And they want the banks to continue to be the credit intermediary because then they regulate the banks. And if you were to take that credit intermediation out of the banking system and put it into private credit or somewhere else, I think the Federal Reserve is going to have a word to say about this somewhere down the line. So I get the move towards private credit. I understand it and it makes sense. But there is a bureaucracy that's eventually going to stand in the doorway here of this and try and change it or alter it or stop it or something along those lines. And that's merely looking at the history of the Federal Reserve. Whenever there's any bit times there's been any kind of, of um, in money market fund in the 1970s, the Federal Reserve was dead set against that because they saw it as a threat to the banking system and they saw it as a threat to them being able to regulate the banking system. So I think this is just a continuation of that trend that they'll have a word to say about private credit at some point when it gets to that critical mass that they start to worry about it. Jim, the the tempo of this uh, bond bear market that may or may not lie ahead of us um, is, of course, of, uh, of great interest to people. It makes a lot of difference whether interest rates uh, uh, go up at uh, 1% every 10 years or 1% every five months, as they seem to have done since the bottom and and only a couple of years ago. Amazing uh, acceleration of rates since 2021, say. You know, we've only had three, we've only had two bond bear markets uh, since the turn of the 20th century. The first one, 1900, 1920, it took a long bond 10 years to move 100 basis points up. And uh, second bond bear market, 1946, 81, it took 10 years for the long dated treasury to move from two and a quarter to three and a quarter. So here we are and uh, say it's uh, the third bond bear market of uh, modern history. And the movement from like nothing to 5% was what, 18 months. So what do you, what does the future, what does your technical work and what do your instincts tell you about the likely tempo of rising rates in the fiscal quarters and years to come? So you're right that this has been this has been completely unprecedented at Macquarie Santa Clara University has got data on the bond market back to the you know the 18th century I think 1793 is when his data goes back and what we've seen in the last 2 years or 3 years has not only been the worst bear market in terms of losses in term, total return ever but it's not even close to that what we've seen before so 
why has these losses that we've seen in the bond market been so much greater than everybody else or any other bear market beginning? Why such a big move? Because of the huge distortion that we had going into this bear market, and that was 12 years of money printing and $16 trillion of negative interest rates. And that we were you know, a lot of what we saw in the beginning, a lot of that 500 basis points was just undoing that mistake. And like I've said earlier, I don't even think we've even overshot yet at this point. We were just undoing a terrible mistake that we saw happen. Uh, and so I guess what I'm going to see from here is that we'll, we'll have a, uh, probably a more standard random walk with the bear market. It will overshoot first, undershoot second, uh, but then kind of zigzag its way higher. Those undershoots, otherwise known as counter trend rallies, could last a, a year or two. One of the reasons, you know, talking about, you know, the technicals in the market uh, and why I said, hi, my name is Jim and I'm, I'm bearish is the overwhelming majority of fund managers today seem to be very bullish on bonds. Uh, the overwhelming majority of fund managers 10 years ago were very bearish on bonds. The mistake they made 10 years ago was, you know, the Nassim Taleb famous quote from 2010, every human should be short bonds, was right 12 years later. It was, they had the idea right that bonds represented no value because of the extraordinary actions of quantitative easing and money printing to force interest rates to an unnatural level. But it stayed at those unnatural levels a lot longer than anybody thought. They all thought it would be a period of a month or a year before it would correct. It took, you know, until 2020, 2021 before we saw that um, start to correct. Well, we did a lot of that now with the worst bear market. But I do think now we're going to have to start to see for rates to go on the overshoot. So I expect that, you know, the 10-year yield, probably middle of next year, might go to at least five and a half. That's where I think fair value is. Then we'll have to see whether or not inflation has settled down enough for the Fed's liking and for the market's liking to stay at that five and a half percent. If inflation stays problematic, and let's call that above three and a half percent on the long run rate of inflation, we might have to see them go higher on interest rates in order to really start to slow things down. Otherwise, we could stay at, at that five and a half percent. But ultimately, if the question is, when is that year to 18 month counter trend rally? It's I don't think it's going to come when you've got, you know, the Bank of America Global Fund Manager survey showing the highest level of bullishness in the 21 year history of that survey. When 80 percent of managers surveyed by Wall Street are saying that interest rates will be lower or bond prices higher in one year. That is almost a universal belief. So we're probably going to have to have some kind of capitulation on that view. And maybe that comes with this whole idea that there isn't going to be a recession and we'll have to review that. And then we could probably start a counter trend rally. Um, and so I still think that we've got a ways to go on the upside for this stage. And then maybe we could start talking about a decent counter trend. But the longer trend is I think we're returning to an inflationary environment similar to what we saw, the way I've defined it, between 1968 and 2001. That was an inflationary environment. Now, you might say 2001, there was no inflation in the 80s and 90s. Yes, but we were worried about inflation and we were relieved there wasn't any. So we saw a rally in stocks and bonds. But right now, I think we're, we're, we're transitioning to a period where we're worried about inflation. And before we can have that real relief that we don't have inflation, I think we're going to have to see at least a capitulation on the view that everybody's long bonds right now and everybody's bullish. And the cons consensus call is the recession is two quarters away and it will probably always stay two quarters away because I don't think we're going to get one right away. So. Even if there's a mild recession, could that actually have outsized impacts in the financial markets last uh, compared to previous ones? And the reason I ask is, in 2007 through 2009, the Fed took rates to zero, started QE. We also had the TARP Act, which was $700 billion. We had the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, which was, I think, over a trillion. We had a United Congress and monetary policy to stimulate. In 2020, when we decided to shut down the economy, the Fed kitchen-sinked monetary policy. We had an alphabet soup of different bailout bills, and we got the stock market to go, to recover all of its losses within a few months. But going forward, we have a Congress that is so divided that they struggle to pass a short-term funding bill. 
We have a Fed that's probably not going to cut rates to zero, at least right away, because they still need to kind of, you know, reestablish their credentials in fighting inflation. If we don't kind of get this kind of monetary, monetary and fiscal boost, if there is even a mild recession, could that, I guess, surprise people to the downside? What do you mean by surprise them to the downside? You mean interest rates fall a lot more than? Well, I, I think expect? I think I think the, the the expectation is if there's a recession, we're going to get a lot of fiscal stimulus and a lot of monetary stimulus. Suddenly, bonds go down, and all long duration assets like money losing tech stocks go up, and that's great for the markets. But if that condition is not true, could it actually lead to, I guess, a worse hit to financial assets than I think one would expect? Oh from- yes. Oh, yes. I mean, what what I think you you run the risk of is if is in the next downturn, if we get Wall Street's for Wall Street's favorite forecast, that is the soft landing. The B of A survey said 75 percent are predicting a soft landing. And I quipped it's the perfect Wall Street forecast because there's no definition for a soft landing. So I predict something that has no definition. I could therefore define it later on to tell you why I was right as opposed to a hard landing, which is a recession that has more of a definition. Or to stick with the metaphor, no landing just means a continued expansion, which is what we've seen for the last several quarters. We know what that is. And so it's harder to redefine that. But if we get some kind of a soft landing or a mild recession or something like that, or something that approaches what people think that means, again, it's not defined. The Fed is going to be in a very, or financial markets, the Congress and the Fed, I don't just want to implicate the Fed, might be in a very difficult spot. If I'm right, we are transitioning to an inflationary period. Any type of answer of, oh, we've got to cut rates massively, uh, we've got to, you know, we've got to see fiscal stimulus, maybe even NQT, maybe talk about doing more money printing, that could produce a toxic reaction in markets because if the concern is inflation. If we are in an inflationary period, the res- the response by markets is going to be more inflation bad. So as you try to fight this recession, you're just going to make it worse if you overstimulate. You were able to get away with that in 2018, 2019, and even through the pandemic because the concern was deflation. And so no amount of money printing is going to make anybody worried about um, inflation when the, the fear is deflation. And to that end, I think you could, you're could you starting to see this in a subtle shift in the market. Now, Jim, you've been around longer than me, and I can never remember the last time that the quarterly refunding announcement became an, a thing. I mean, I know professional managers that didn't even know there was a quarterly refunding announcement because it wasn't ever that important when it came to the trend in the market. Well, if you look at what is really driving it, Um, Stephen Hu, who works at Bloomberg now, did a PhD dissertation on this, the University of Michigan in 2018. And in it, he found that if you look at the stock bond correlation, that explains the times that supply bothers the bond market and supply doesn't bother it. When the stock bond relationship is above zero, meaning that the, uh, the correlation is above zero, that's what I meant to say, stock bond correlation, stock bond correlation is above zero. That means stocks and bonds move up and down together. What is that environment that they move up and down together? That is an inflationary environment. They're worried about inflation. It's bad for both. They either both rally when you don't have inflation or they both sell off when you do have inflation. In that environment, supply matters. That there's a very tight relationship between the supply that the uh, treasury issues and say term premium. In a period where the stock bond correlation is negative, which is what it had been from 2000 to about earlier this year. There's no relationship with supply. So you find yourself, if you look at 2020, 2021, when the CARES Act passed, when we had a $4 trillion deficit, 18% of GDP, and we were just blowing all the records away in terms of issuance of bonds, 10-year yields stuck at 1%. Nobody cared about supply because they weren't worried about inflation. But today, at much less supply levels, we're all mesmerized by supply because we got the causation backwards. We are transitioning to inflation, and it's inflation that's driving the theory or the fear that's causing supply to be the problem. So it's inflation is the is the the cause and the effect is supply. Yeah, I I, I think there's a lot of truth there. I mean, in the uh, in the 1980s during the Reagan terms, um, uh, yields were sawed in half as the public debt tripled. I believe that's those are the figures. Um, but in the 1970s, Jim, uh, supply was in fact a thing, and the quarterly refunding 
was uh, was a point of, of focus because perhaps because of uh, inflation was a driver, but still um, uh, supply seemed to matter as it subsequently did not matter in the very in the least. But to, you know, I wonder if if uh, there could be a return to concern about uh, what uh, uh, the old folks would call the public credit that has not been, as you say, a thing. In, in uh, basically in our lifetimes, mine being rather longer. But the idea that the United States, uh, gifted as it has been with a reserve currency, could ever have to worry about the condition of its, fi- of its finances, of the public finances, that has not, that's been a talking point, but it's never been a substantive investment point. I remember, I remember when Reagan, or you perhaps read about it in grade school, Jim, but when Reagan got in the television in 1981 and said, uh, all you have to know about our financial troubles is the public debt has just topped $1 trillion. $1 trillion. So uh, what is it today? It's more than that, right, Jim? $33 trillion. So is it, here's my question. Is it possible that the, uh, that the country, that the United States government examined as one would, um, a, a, you know, a, a, like a city of New York? The city of New York is a, is a, is a credit-sensitive operation. You wouldn't know it from the way the bonds trade, but still, it's, it can't print its own money. Is the United States coming to be regarded worldwide as a credit-sensitive issuer? And is there a ceiling on the public debt? So, so, so not now, but coming soon. I think there's a lot of people politically that would like to see the U.S. dollar lose its, its status as the reserve currency. And if that would ever happen, and you just recently had a BRICS meeting in South Africa with Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, talk about finding an alternative to the dollar as the reserve currency. The only problem or the benefit that the dollar has is there is not an alternative to it. There's no other, uh, there is no other uh, bond market that can handle the, the level of payments or which runs in the trillions a day or the rule of law or the ease and comfort of trying to do transactions in dollars on a global basis. If you were to switch to any other currency, frictions go up, costs go up, uh, transparency goes down, and rule of law becomes, depending on where you go, a lot more questionable. But that's not to say that the dollar is safe forever. It's not going to be safe forever. As soon as an alternative shows up, my guess is it will be some kind of digital alternative, but we might still be many years away, maybe even more than a decade away, before something like that comes up. And the reason I say that is I I just don't see it being the euro or the yen or any other fiat currency that could possibly take its role. And it's certainly not going to be the Russian ruble or the Saudi dinar or the Chinese one B. It's those are not, those are just from a rule of law standpoint, I don't think anybody would would accept those as far as a reserve currency. So the US has this, you know, exorbitant privilege. The Jusark is staying in the 1960s, I think they coined that phrase. And b- because of that absorbent privilege, credit has not been an issue for the U.S. But inflation can become that issue in lieu of it as we see massive money printing, fiscal irresponsibility. You know, so yes, the U.S. doesn't default, but your dollars just become worth a whole lot less because of of inflation and and just printing more and more supply means that the price could go down. So I don't think we're quite there yet, but we will get there. And finally, the history of this is, if you look at any country that runs into some kind of a credit problem with their sovereign, it is never ever that politicians will get responsibility to fix it. It is that the financial markets will impose a discipline on them and force them to do something about it. The latest example of that was last year in the UK. So Liz Trust, there's a trivia question for you, who was the uh, prime minister when the queen died? It was Liz Trust for 49 days. Uh, She proposed a mini budget and parliament was okay with it, but the guilt market was not. And so the guilt market to coin, to riff off of uh, Paul's favorite line, the guilt market did the work that the uh, parliament wouldn't do. And it set about to kill the mini budget, which was going to cut taxes, increase spending and make a bigger deficit. So in eight days in September of last year, 30-year gilts went up 150 basis points. 
Uh, the Bank of England's got 300 years of data. They've never gone up 150 basis points in eight days. That got the effect that the market wanted. It killed the mini budget. It brought some fiscal responsibility to parliament. And it also had unintended consequences. As you remember the famous meme, Liz Truss didn't last as long as a head of lettuce. Uh, and so she was out very quickly. So this is how you wind up. If there's going to be uh, a credit discipline that needs to be imposed, or there is a limit on deficits or government spending, it's not going to be, oh, if we just elect these politicians with this viewpoint, that this will fix the problem. It's almost never that. It's the financial markets will lean on you so hard and put you down on your knees that you have no choice but to take a fiscal discipline that you otherwise wouldn't because it will force it on you. We saw that last year in the UK. Jim Bianco, thank you. My name is Jim Grant, and I'm bullish on Jim Bianco. That's how I'm going to introduce myself from now on. So thank you for being with us, Jim. Uh, thank you, Evan. Thank you. Henry, well done. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, happy Thanksgiving, or I hope you have had a happy Thanksgiving. And we'll talk to you soon on behalf of uh, Current Yield, Grant's Interest Rate Observer of the Year.